Uh, so uh, I'd just like to begin by thanking Father Oliver and also um, Dr. Hewitt for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'm old enough to have met Herbert McCabe on various occasions. In fact, when I first came to Oxford as an undergraduate, uh, a friend back at home who was a bit concerned about my spiritual state for reasons I can't quite recall, actually arranged for me to meet Herbert McCabe. So I first arrived at Blackfriars as this terrified, startled undergraduate, and McCabe was propelled in my direction. And we had a conversation that probably lasted for about two minutes. Um, and then we dispersed, and I, I saw him on various other occasions. But so I had that very early in my in my kind of own intellectual formation and <laughs> spiritual formation. I had that very early encounter with him, and so I'm uh, particularly pleased all, all all these years later, decades later, to have this opportunity through the form of this conference to think a little more uh, systematically about McCabe's thought and to learn from others about McCabe's thought. Uh, and certainly the work, the reading I've done. Um, you may judge otherwise after you've heard the paper, but <laughs> when preparing this paper, the reading I've done seems to me to have borne out. The, the judgment of my friend all those years ago that, uh, for me, engaging with the thought of McCabe would be spiritually productive. It's only some decades after the original meeting that I've come to realize the extent to which that's true. Um, so I have a written text, and I think I'd probably just stick to it in the interest of roughly kind of trying to keep to time. Um, you can hear me at the back? Great, okay. Um, so I'm gonna just talk about one paper. Um, so uh, Stephen very helpfully sketched the kind of broader landscape within which we can set this paper um, as part of a, an exchange of a kind that unfolds in the pages of God Matters. And the paper I'm going to talk about is the Transubstantiation and the Real Presence paper, published in 1969. So I'll be touching on some of the same themes as, as Stephen. Uh, for instance, the, as you can see from my title, the idea of entering a new world and the idea of revolutionary change. Um, but I suspect um, I'm probably trying to give a um, Yes, too much sense to some of, <laughs> some of these ideas in, in McCabe rather than respecting the, um, the extent to which they're to be treated uh, in some measure apophatically. So um, I'm going to start by setting out some of McCabe's concerns in this particular paper. There it is. Um, and um, what I'm going to try and do is pull out four themes from the paper. Uh, and my thought is roughly that, you know, for McCabe, these are central desiderata for any account of the Eucharist and Eucharistic change and the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Uh, and I'm then going to step, step, step away from McCabe's text and introduce another kind of framework of thinking, which may involve just simply a distortion of his account of things. But my hope is that by introducing this other framework of thinking, we can then return to some of these McCabean themes in the later phases of the paper and perhaps have some new, new vantage point upon their import and Im importance is my thought. So, uh, so why don't I just briefly introduce these uh, four themes. The first, first two themes I'm going to take from McCabe are kind of negative in character. Basically, he's telling us how we should not think of the <laughs> Eucharistic change. So um, there you go. So um, here's one, one um, kind of account that we are to avoid if our understanding of the Eucharist is to be properly formed. To say that Christ is present in the Eucharist is not to say, not to say that food and drink are in themselves in any way different from other food and drink. It is to speak, presumably simply here, of the role which they play in a certain religious ceremony. Um, let me check the time, sorry. Um, so I may be finished about 12.30. Excellent. Okay, so, um, um, so uh, as you can see, in the, uh, take it in, in brief in this text, um, McCabe wants to say there's a certain account of the Eucharist that we've got to forswear, and that's the account which understands the, the significance of Eucharistic change simply by reference to the role that the, the Eucharistic elements play within that particular ritual setting. At the same time, there's another kind of a view that we have to exclude, he thinks, if we're um, to, to give a proper account of these matters, and that's the view according to which Christ is present. Yeah, is, to say that Christ is present is to say that the food and drink have changed in themselves, have become something altogether different from food and drink, that this change is hidden from us. So in brief, I take it these, these two pictures that we are repudiating, if we follow McCabe, kind of occupy the end of a spectrum in a sort of way. One, in a sense, represents, I take it from his point of view, the change is too superficial in character because it's concerned simply with a change in role. The other, in a sense, in a certain sense, <laughs> uh, departs in the wrong sort of direction from the idea that it's simply a change in role by saying that actually what's involved is a change in the food and drink, as he puts it here, in themselves, so that there's a, they're now different from food and drink. So he wants to avoid both of these accounts, clearly, one of which, according to the which the notion of role is central and one of which um, the notion of, as he puts it at one point, something like a chemical change uh, is the way in which we're to model change in the case of the Eucharist. So having defined in this way the boundaries, kind of, of the conceptual space um, on McCabe's view, that any satisfactory understanding of the change in the Eucharistic elements will need to occupy, um, McCabe then begins to develop his own positive account of the matter. 
So I'm going to just want to pluck out two themes um, that pick out his positive understanding of the nature of the change. Um, he says at one point that at the core of his position is the idea that in the Eucharist, our language has become Christ's body. And he adds that much of what follows will be devoted to trying to make sense of what he calls this enigmatic utterance. Um, so we can see that expression embedded in its literary context here. Uh, Christ is present to us because our language has become his body. This is what is meant by saying that his body is present to us sacramentally, not exactly by being signified or symbolized, but by being our sign, our symbol. So I'm going to take this as a third Maccabian desideratum for any account of the change in the Eucharistic elements. Um, in brief, on this account, we need to find a way of understanding how it might be that the presence of Christ in the Eucharist is a matter of his body having become our sign, or equivalently, I take it, of our language having become his body. There's one further Maccabian theme that I want to pick up um, in the course of this discussion. And this is the idea that through their participation in the Eucharist, the Christian is in a certain sense able to enter a new world. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the theme that Stephen was addressing earlier and the idea of revolutionary change. And this thought is picked up in the following passage. Um, here he's um, giving an account of the notion of revolution, um, which we've already um, heard about, um, as distinct from kind of reform. Um, it involves entering a new world, as McCabe puts it here, not merely a modification of this world. And McCabe is clearly the view then that uh, Eucharistic change is revolutionary in this sense. And he gives a little kind of argument to substantiate this claim. I think first of all then he reflects on the kind of change that is involved in resurrection. On McCabe's account, resurrection of mat is a matter of entering, in some relevant sense, a new world. And therefore a case of revolutionary change. But we ought not to conclude, he insists, that resurrection is therefore a matter of quitting this world for another. And he writes that death and resurrection then does not mean a departure from this world to some other separate world. It does not mean substituting another life for this one. It means a revolutionary transformation and hence intensification of this bodily life. Right, so in turn, McCabe draws out the meaning of this claim that resurrection, while a case of revolutionary change, and therefore entering a new world, is not a matter of substituting another life for this one by citing the appearances of the risen Jesus, which provide one way of understanding, on his account, what it would be to enter a new world without quitting this world. For McCabe, the resurrected Christ belongs to the new world. In some sense, he is the new world. But in the resurrection appearances, He's presented to his disciples under the forms of this world. As he puts the point, in these appearances, Jesus presents an intersection of future and present. He is the future world, the body in whom our bodies are to find unity and final humanity, the medium of communication in which mankind is ultimately to realize itself. He is the future world, but he appears as a body of the present world. He appears under the sensory forms of the present world. So there is on McCabe's account, I take it, a conceptual thread running from the idea of revolutionary change to the idea of entering a new world to the idea of resurrection as revolutionary and therefore a matter of entering a new world to the thought that in the resurrection appearances of Jesus, this new world is presented to us under the appearances of this world. So that in this context, revolutionary change and entering a new world takes the form not of quitting this world, but of a future world in some fashion intersecting with the present world. It's worth, yes, I just, I won't dwell on the thought, but it's worth noting that the, the, this, this idea of communication or of language as being central, its account clearly shows up in this text too. And it's clear that then McCabe takes there to be some connection between the third and fourth of the motifs that I picked out from his text. And I'll come back to that question. Finally, McCabe applies this cluster of ideas to the case of Eucharistic change. Since here too, revolutionary change can be understood in terms of the idea of the future, being manifested under the sensory appearances of the present. And here's a text where he develops this idea. Now, what I want to suggest is that in the Eucharist, uh, we have a similar intersection to those um, that arise with respect to the resurrection appearances of Christ. We have food and drink of the future world, which appears as food and drink of this present world. Right. So, um, so there are four themes I've taken from McCabe rather, rather quickly, two of which are a matter of proscription, ideas we need to avoid, and two of which are a matter of prescription, ideas that we ought, so far as we can, to build into our own account of the Eucharist. 
So what I'm going to do now, and this may just be a very, very bad wrong turn, um, and you're welcome to tell me as much. What I'm going <laughs> to do now is reflect on another bundle of phenomena, more familiar phenomena, um, perhaps precisely mistaking McCabe's point in wanting to describe these revolution, these theological cases of change as revolutionary. I'm going to reach for <laughs> kind of analogies of a kind for what he's describing with reference to familiar situations of experience. So off we go. Um, I'm going to take as my initial cue from McCabe's take my initial cue from a cape suggestion in the Eucharist, the present world in some sense intersects with a future world. So that in this sense, through participation in the rite, we can enter a new world. So I'm going to begin by thinking about what might be a connected, or may turn out to be not very constructively connected theme, <laughs> um, which is um, the idea of an intersection, uh, not of present and future now, but of present and past. I'm going to start there. So we're all familiar with the thought that the history the past of a place can enter into its significance in the present. To take a religious example of the phenomenon pilgrims to a place such as Lourdes, I thought I ought to give a distinctively Catholic kind of example in this setting. Um, so, <laughs> pilgrims to a place such as Lourdes are moved, I take it not simply nor most fundamentally by the thought that miracles of healing continue to occur here. So it's not some feature of the place um, with respect to its presence that's um, at stake, but by moved by the belief that an event of divine disclosure once happened here. In the background of such practices seems to stand the thought that the history of a place can call for practical acknowledgement in the present. That the pilgrim in the history of the place as a site of divine disclosure is acknowledged in the present by taking up the relevant practical comportment when located at the place in the present. So in this respect, the history of such places does not simply concern the past, but as it were, reaches into the present by virtue of requiring us, or at least inviting us, to comport ourselves in certain ways when located at the place in the present, as a condition of giving due recognition to its past. In this sense, we can speak of the history of a site being, as it were, sorry about this expression, stored up and then encountered in the present in the form of an ethical demand concerning how we are to conduct ourselves when located at the site in the present. So I think it would be easy to multiply such examples. Um, and in the interest of meeting for lunch, I'm not going to, but I've clearly, <laughs> across a whole range of domains, clearly we take uh, the history of places, of uh, human beings, um, of even everyday sensory objects to be significant in defining the, the character of our relationship to them in the present. That's to say, we take, we, we, we suppose across all these contexts that in various respects, our relationship to a, a place, a person, a thing in the present can be assessed for appropriateness in various ways by reference to the history of the place or person or thing. So in that respect, um, I'm going to say in this rather, uh, perhaps rather strange sense, but clearly trying to track McCabe's form of words, then in a certain way, if, and across all these contexts, we, uh, we are dealing with a kind of intersection of the past and the present. So the past defines the character of our present in certain respects, not least insofar as it, in certain cases anyway, constitutes a kind of ethical demand or at least invitation to comport ourselves in certain ways when our, in our dealings with the, the place or personal thing in the present. So um, there's a first little step, perhaps uh, again it may be just a misstep, but let's suppose for the sake of the paper <laughs> this is a step, somewhat in the direction of the case that interests McCabe, um, which is of course the case of in, the Senate, the, where a future world is said to intersect the present world. So let's now try to take a further step in the direction of the case that interests McCabe, Eucharistic change, the future world intersecting the present world, by thinking about how it might be in our present experience, a future world can intersect with this present world. So I'm gonna turn here again with a nod to the company and I, I, um, I hesitate to move, you can so much as use the expression Thomas Aquinas in the presence of all, all these Dominicans, but I'm gonna take Thomas Aquinas' account of neighbor love, which seems to me to be, I apologize to those of you who heard to me reflect on these things before, I think I did on one other Black Prize occasion, but I'm gonna take Aquinas' treatment of the notion of neighbor love um, as one way of beginning to understand how we might send, make sense, somewhat by analogy with the case of the past intersecting the present, of the notion of the future intersecting the present. So neighbor love is, of course, a the object of a dominical command. And for this reason alone, of course, it's obligatory for Christians. But in his discussion of the question of why the attitudes and behavior that constitute neighbor love um, are for Christians fitting and indeed required, uh, Thomas Aquinas, on my reading at least, develops a rather different account of the significance of the practice. So 
In the following passage, um, which I'm about to pull up with a nod to, to my left, um, it hasn't, oh, the nod has happened, yes, there we go. <laughs> um, so in this passage, display before you, um, Aquinas, I think, is actually considering the question of whether the angels are properly the objects of neighbor love, and that might seem a somewhat specialized kind of concern, but I take it he makes the same kind of move when addressing the question of why human beings are properly the object of neighbor love. And as you can see, he writes then, the friendship of charity, that is neighbor love, is founded upon the everlasting happiness in which human beings share in common with the angels. Um, for it's written in the resurrection, human beings shall be, I want to accentuate the, the future reference there, of course, <laughs> shall be as the angels of God in heaven. It's therefore evident that the friendship of charity extends also to the angels, by parity of argument to human beings. So on this account that Aquinas gives us here, it seems we ought to show the friendship of charity or neighbor love to the angels as to our fellow human beings for the reason that they will share with us in the everlasting happiness of the beatific vision. So the fittingness of neighbor love, I take it, is here being rooted in a certain claim about the future. Whew. In ordinary situations of choice, we commonly appeal, of course, to the future when considering how we are to act in the present. And typically, such reasoning takes a consequentialist form, I take it. Um, but Aquinas' interest in the future in this passage is not, I take it, of that kind. I take it, his thought is not that we should relate to other human beings and the angels in certain ways in the present, because thereby we will make certain outcomes more likely. That is, I take it, he's not appealing to the causal or instrumental efficacy of the ways of acting that we associate with neighbor love. The proposal seems to be rather that in relating to others here and now as our neighbors, we thereby give due acknowledgement to the truth that they will one day in the eschatological future stand in a certain relationship to us. Hmm. If that's the right way of expressing Aquinas' thought, and I'm very ready to be corrected, then we could say that his proposal is that rather as the past can intersect with the present when some feature of an individual's history makes a practical and attitudinal claim upon us in the present, so the future, and specifically the eschatological future, can intersect with the present when our relations to others in the present are subject to some requirement that is rooted in that future. Or as we might say, to put the matter in Maccabian terms, the Christian practice of neighbor love is founded upon the truth that a future world, sorry if this is straining the sense of McKay too much, the world of the eschatological future can be presented to us under the conditions of this world, under the sensory appearances here and now, by virtue of the fact that this eschatological future makes a certain ethical claim upon us in our relations to other human beings, requiring us to relate to them as our neighbors, here and now in the present. Okay, so um, this account rests in particular on the idea that we will in the eschatological future stand in a relationship of friendship with other human beings, one that's founded upon our sharing in the fundamental good of everlasting happiness. Okay, um, so I'm now, I'm now interested in the question of why should it be <laughs> that neighbor love constitutes a fitting response to this truth about our shared eschatological future? Um, and the background thought I take it is that by virtue of sharing with others in the, in the eschatological future, in this most fundamental of creaturely goods, the vision of God, we will thereby enjoy a special kind of solidarity with them. Or as Aquinas puts the point elsewhere in this same question, a special kind of fellowship with them. So I take it we can find a counterpart for this proposal in our attitudes towards past friendships. I take it part of what Aquinas is arguing here is that by virtue of the fact that we will one day stand in this relationship of friendship to others, a particularly profound form of friendship in our relation with others, that truth about our shared future ex exercises a certain ethical claim upon us in our relations to other human beings in the present. And I take it we can find a counterpart for that sort of proposal structurally in our attitudes towards past friendships. If a person was once my friend, then we're inclined to suppose my relationship to that person in the present can be held accountable to this truth about our shared past. And this will be so, we might suppose, at least in some measure, uh, even if the friendship has now lapsed. And similarly, on my account, Aquinas seems to be suggesting that if my relationship to another person will one day involve the unsurpassably profound form of friendship that consists of sharing in the beatific vision, then my relation to that person in the present can be deemed more or less appropriate relative to this truth about our shared future. If we were to ask Aquinas, how is it that this truth about other human beings can be afforded due acknowledgement in the practice of neighbor love, 
he would say, I take it, that the pattern of life we associate with neighbor love gives due recognition to the eschatological identity of others as our prospective friends on account of the fact that it is itself a form of friendship, since it is, as he says, the friendship of charity. Accordingly, we may say that neighbor love reckons appropriately with our shared eschatological future by virtue of, in some measure, foreshadowing that future, involving a mode of life that is in some way patterned upon that future. Gosh. So, on this understanding, neighbor love constitutes a response to the future referenced identity of other human beings. In, we might say, the ethical mode, in the practice of neighbor love, we recognize the depth of our solidarity with other human beings in the eschaton by subjecting our relationship to them in the present to a radical ethical demand. And the appropriateness of this response is founded on the fact that hereby we bring our relations to others in the present into alignment with this future truth by adopting a mode of life that is in some way patterned on that future life with our relations to them so far as we can by living already, even if still in inchoate form, as their friends. Um, just making some sense? I hope it goes a bad, bad wrong turn I know about five pages back, but <laughs> I'm going to press on now, there's no turning back. So, so obviously the basic thought is that just as we recognize the significance of the past in our dealings with other individuals, people and places and things, um, insofar as we think that our, our relations to them in the present can be more or less appropriate, we can acknowledge that past by virtue of the, the practical relationship we take up in relation to these, these people and places and things on account of their past, that I'm saying, it seems to me, you could read Aquinas as making a similar move, and with reference to the eschatological future, saying that neighbor love in particular constitutes a proper response to this truth about our shared future. By virtue, I've added this further thought, by virtue of being a mode of life that in some ways patterned upon, resembles in some measure so far as possible under the conditions of this life, um, the profound kind of fellowship that we will enjoy with others in the eschatological future. So it's worth noting, if possibly, if I, possibly not if there's not time, but uh, yes, it's worth noting how this Anyway, in brief, what I, what I was going to say is just this, that you could imagine someone reading um, the idea of our eschatological future si simply as um, uh, a kind of limiting ideal, saying, look, here's a picture of, of how an ideal human society would look. And that's the reason exercise is a kind of ethical claim upon us in the present, because if that's what the ideal community looks like, then surely in our relations to others in the present, we should try as far as we can to approximate to the ideal. But I take it that something else is going on in Aquinas' kind of story. It matters that this eschatological ideal should be not simply an ideal, but realized that what we're doing in our relations to others in the present is acting in such a way as to give due acknowledgement to this truth about our shared future, rather than simply enacting some idealized picture of what that future might in principle be. Um, so, um, so far we've been considering the idea that past and also the future, including the eschatological future, can in a certain sense intersect with the present, insofar as the past and future of human beings and of places and things can call for practical acknowledgement in the present. So let's now take a further step in the direction of the case that interests McCabe by considering how we might understand the idea that future and present intersect in the Eucharist. So, um, I take it that on Aquinas' understanding, our eschatological future consists not only in a perfected relationship of friendship with other human beings, the aspect of that future with which we've been focally concerned to this point, but also in the, in the vision of God, where these two states of affairs are, of course, connected. The future friendship, this future friendship to other human beings, um, runs deep because it involves a sharing in the unsurpassable good of the vision of God. So if we follow Aquinas' account of neighbor love, as I've expounded it here, we should say that neighbor love constitutes a fitting response in the present to the first of these two elements of the storied identity of other human beings, namely the fact that we will one day share with them in a perfected relationship of friendship. And we might wonder then whether there's a pattern of life open to us in the present whereby we can also give due recognition to the second, the God-directed element of the forward-looking storied identity of other human beings. That is to the fact that this friendship will take the particular form of a sharing in the beatific vision. 
Is this making some sense? So obviously what I'm trying to do is to kind of build on Aquinas' story about neighbor love and its fittingness with respect to some aspect of our eschatological future, namely the fact that in the eschatological future, our relations to other human beings will be one of friendship. And saying, well, then we can read neighbor love as a proper response to that aspect of our eschatological future. And I'm wondering then whether you could make in principle a similar kind of move where you begin to fill out this picture of our eschatological future. So you refer not just simply to that aspect of it, which involves our entering into a deep-seated relationship of friendship with others, but you, you specify more fully what that friendship will involve, namely the, the shared vision of God. And so I'm asking then whether we could, as it were, take Aquinas's pattern of argument, as I've understood it anyway, with respect to neighbor love, to provide the basis for um, another, ki another, another kind of claim about how a certain kind of activity in the present is appropriate for us, and not simply by virtue of the fact that hereby we give due recognition to the fact that our future relations to others will be one of present, one of friendship, but by virtue of the fact that hereby in the present we give due recognition to the fact that our friendship with others will take a particular form. We will have this God-directed, God-involving form. Um, I've completely lost my place, so it'll be a brief pause. Um. <laughs> okay. As we've seen, for Aquinas, um, neighbor love constitutes a fitting response to the truth that we will one day share with others in a perfected relationship of friendship, for the reason that it is itself, even if only imperfectly, a form of friendship. And we might wonder whether similarly there is an activity open to us in the present that will allow us in some fashion to foreshadow that truth about uh, that our relation to others in the eschatological future will be founded upon a sharing in the vision of God. In other words, can we find some activity available to us in the present that will anticipate the God-directed character of our future relations to other human beings in rather the way that neighbor love anticipates the fact that those relations will take the form of friendship? So now that follows a very large claim, which I'll race through. Um, <laughs> on the traditional Christian understanding, I take it, the Eucharist bears precisely this significance. Um, it is most simply, of course, a memorial meal, looking back to the Last Supper and thence to Christ's Passion, as well as recalling the Passover. But it also, of course, looks forward to the heavenly banquet, wherein we will enjoy a newly intimate relationship to God and thereby a new kind of solidarity with other human beings. This account of the proleptic significance of the rite can be grounded very directly in the biblical text. I don't think I'm even going to try and expound the biblical text at this point because um, numbers of people here will be biblical scholars. And I, th I, think, I think we can agree that this is a, um, well, bo bo both by reference to Jesus' words at the Last Supper and by reference, for example, to the Paul's exposition of the significance of the Eucharist, I think take it, it's quite easy to build up this picture according to which um, the Eucharist has this kind of significance um, of involving a kind of looking forward to an eschatological future that has both these, both these features uh, insofar it it's both involves a, an eschatological future that involves a deepening in our relations with other human beings, but also of course it's a the eschatological banquet is, is one in which the, the Christian encounters Christ, and therefore it's a God-involving kind of uh, friendship with others that's being envisaged. So in brief, on this understanding of the significance of the Eucharist, we can think of this shared meal as a foreshadowing of our eschatological future, both with respect to the dimension of that future that concerns our relations to other human beings, and with respect to the dimension of that future that concerns our relationship to God, where the second relationship stands as the ground of the first. So, um, perhaps it will not be too much of a diversion to consider how Aquinas' treatment of the idea of Jesus' bodily presence in the Eucharist can be folded into this account. Aquinas maintains that it matters that the body of Christ should be present in the Eucharist, quote, in very truth, and not, quote, merely as in a figure or sign both because this is what follows from the plain sense of Jesus' words at the Last Supper, when he remarks, this is my body, and because it's a mark of friendship that friends should be present to one another in bodily form. So, sorry, there's been a long interlude, but there's another one. <laughs> now Aquinas writes, um, it is because it is a special feature of friendship to live together with friends, 
as the philosopher says. He promises us his bodily presence as a reward, yet meanwhile in our pilgrimage, here and now, he does not deprive us of his bodily presence, but unites us with himself in this sacrament through the truth of his body and blood. It's notable that, as in his discussion of neighbor love, so here, when thinking about Christ's presence in the Eucharist, Aquinas appeals to the theme of friendship. So on this general approach, friendship turns out to be integral to the Christian life along several related dimensions. First of all, when Christians extend the regard of neighbor love to other human beings, thereby they enter into a form of friendship with them, one whose appropriateness is defined by reference to the truth that we will one day, in the eschaton, share with them in a deep-seated relationship of friendship. Moreover, according to this passage in the Eucharist, the Christian is related to Christ as to a friend by virtue of Christ's bodily presence in the body, in the bread and wine. And in turn, since the individual Christian's Eucharistically mediated friendship to Christ is shared with other participants in the rite, the Eucharist therefore stands as a proleptic enactment of the God-directed form of human community that will be realized in perfected form at the heavenly banquet. And from this final consideration, it follows that in the Eucharist, Christians can prefigure or proleptically enact this shared future, both along the dimension of interhuman friendship and along the dimension of friendship with God, where the latter stands as the basis of the former. And from this truth in turn, it follows that just as neighbor love offers a way of living congruently or appropriately with respect to the interhuman dimension of the eschaton, by virtue of being itself a form of friendship, so Eucharistic practice constitutes an appropriate acknowledgement of the interhuman dimension of our eschatological future, along with its God-directed ground. Because in the Eucharist, we can foreshadow that future, both with respect to our relations with other human beings and with respect to our relationship to God, and in such a way as to recognize how the first of these states is grounded in the second. In sum, Eucharistic practice on this reading gives due recognition to our eschatological future. It acknowledges in the present the eschatological identity of other human beings by foreshadowing both their interhuman and God, both the interhuman and God-directed strands of that identity and the relationship between them. Um, so there you go. So that's, that's the diversion where I try to, to sketch out um, somewhat independently of McCabe, a way of thinking about the Eucharist, one that be is begins from his thoughts about how the Eucharist involves in some sense an intersection of future world and past world. And clearly I've tried to understand that by reference to the idea that we can speak of an intersection of, the, in a sense, the past world and present world by thinking about how truths about the past can exercise a claim upon us in the present in ethical and other modes. And then in turn, I take in Aquinas' discussion of neighbor love as a way of thinking how we might make the same kind of argumentative move, not now by reference to the past, but by reference to our eschatological future, and specifically make that kind of argumentative move with respect to one feature of the eschatological future, namely that feature which concerns, well, which consists in our sharing with others in a deep-seated relationship of friendship in the future. So I take it the background thought is that neighbor love does indeed constitute a fitting acknowledgement of this eschatological future by in some measure involving a pattern of life that um, maps onto that eschatological future and for that reason constitutes due recognition of that future. And then of course what I've tried to do is return building on Aquinas' treatment of neighbor love to the case of um, the Eucharist and to argue that maybe the Eucharist constitutes a pattern of life which similarly acknowledges our eschatological future but acknowledges it with respect to the, this further aspect of the eschatological future, um, namely that it involves not simply a perfected relationship of friendship with other human beings but a perfected relationship of friendship that's anchored in relationship to God. Um, so now I'm going to come back to McCabe's essay and um, stumble my way through the, the various desiderata for an account of the Eucharist that I introduced at the beginning, McCabean desiderata for an account of the Eucharist that I introduced at the beginning. Um, so, um, as we've seen, McCabe represents Eucharistic change, the change, as he says in Eucharistic food and drink, as a revolutionary change. And as we've noted, that proposal involves in turn the idea that this change cannot be understood simply in terms of, as it were, the re a reshuffling of the constituents of the present world 
And in turn, that thought, thought suggests that if we take the resurrection of appearances of Christ as our guide, that in the Eucharist, a future world, in some way, breaks into our current world and is given to us under the appearances of the present world. So, um, the account that I've just been developing clearly doesn't capture all of the nuances in McCabe's position, um, as you can see immediately by reference to Stephen's paper, which was exploring other aspects of, of the McCabean story. But it does, I, I'm proposing, offer one way of making sense of this central idea that in the Eucharist a future world is rendered present under the appearances of the existing world. Specifically, if we allow that the past and equally the future of an individual can be presented to us under the sensory appearances of the present, insofar as that past or future makes an ethical demand upon us in the present, or in general calls for acknowledgement in the present, then by extension we may say that the eschatological, fu eschatological future can be presented to us not only in the person of our neighbour, in the form of an ethical demand, but also in the Eucharistic elements, insofar as through our relationship to those elements we're able to take up a pattern of life that foreshadows our eschatological future with respect to both its interhuman and God-directed dimensions. In this sense then, and it may not be the right sense, but nonetheless, here we go. In this sense, then, we can speak of a future world, the world of the eschatological future, as presented to us under the appearances of the bread and wine, insofar as the bread and wine, when located in the Eucharistic context, and given the significance that derives from Jesus' words, this is my body and this is my blood, provide a setting within which we can conform our lives to our eschatological future, and thereby live appropriately with respect to that future. Of course, there are other ways in which we might try to bring our lives into alignment with that future so conceived, that eschatological future so conceived. For instance, by simply calling to mind the idea that we will one day share with others in the life of God when we, re when we relate to them as our neighbours, call to mind that idea. But if we follow Aquinas' teaching that Christ is present in the Eucharist in bodily terms, and the associated thought that it is, as he says, a special feature of friendship to live together with friends in bodily terms, it will follow that this, in, this purely intellectual acknowledgement of the eschatological future, while of course of some importance, will fall short of the deeper kind of reckoning with that future that is made possible in our bodily engagement with the Eucharistic elements. Analogously, we sometimes suppose that we can acknowledge an event with a particular kind of seriousness when located at the place where the event took place. Okay. Or acknowledge a now deceased person with a particular kind of seriousness when present at the place where their body is interred. And plausibly, this is because we suppose that in these cases we are able to acknowledge the event or the person, not just in thought, but in practice, by taking up the requisite bodily demeanour in our dealings with the material world, so that the whole person is thereby implicated in this act of recognition. So similarly, we might say, that given the licence provided by Christ's words at the Last Supper, in, in the Eucharist, the Christian is able to orient themselves to the eschatological future, not only in thought, but in deed, and accordingly to acknowledge that future with a special kind of seriousness and indeed, from a Christian point of view, definitively. Right, so I've, try, I've, I've tried <laughs> to use the kind of framework that I was introducing in the course of the paper, beginning with the idea that we can, in some sense, um, in some sense the past can be presented to us on the sensory appearances of the present. I've tried to develop, see how that strand of reflection might be related to McCabe's talk about how in the Eucharist a future world is presented to us under the appearances under the sensory appearances of the present world. Um, but let me now turn to, um, more briefly, and I think less sat satisfactorily, still less satisfactorily, the second of the positive themes that McCabe enunciates at the beginning of the paper. Um, as we've seen, McCabe himself supposes there's a connection between this understanding of the Eucharist, according to which in the right a future world breaks into this world, and his enigmatic claim, according to which Christ is present to us in the Eucharist because our language, as McKay puts the point, has become his body, or because Christ has become our sign. 
We can read these comments. Oh no, not, not supposed to happen. We can read these comments in the light of McCabe's observation that when we speak of communic ah, when we speak of communication, uh, we're not necessarily talking about the passing of messages. Communication is the sharing of a common world of meanings, a theme that Stephen was exploring. And on this perspective, um, McCabe adds, we should recognize that the, fun the fundamental importance of the body in all communication, the body is the source of all communication. And again, Stephen filled out that picture a little bit with reference to this, this paper. Um, so given the account we've been sketching, we may say that by taking up a certain enacted relationship to relevant portions of the material world in the Eucharist, the Christian is able to acknowledge with a particular depth and seriousness, the eschatological future. Which is to say, I take it, that through their bodily comportment in this rite, the Christian is able to share a common world of meanings. So in these respects, the conception of the Eucharist that we've been sketching lends itself, I take it, very readily to the thought the Eucharist is a communication in the sense that McCabe describes here. And of course, it's also one that's very evidently grounded in the dispositions of the body. And we can read McCabe's enigmatic utterance, I think, somewhat similarly, by reading the expression, our language has become Christ's body, as meaning that by taking up the requisite relationship to the Eucharistic elements, read as Jesus' body in whatever sense is licensed by Jesus' words at the Last Supper, sorry, big claim there, we can reckon with our eschatological future with respect both to its interhuman and God-directed strands, and accordingly with a kind of seriousness that would not otherwise be possible. So in this way, our relationship to the Eucharistic elements, considered as Christ's body, constitutes, I take it, a communicative, communicative act with a very particular content. Perhaps it's worth noting the difference between this sort of account and one that understands the change in the Eucharistic elements simply by reference to the idea of transubstantiation. The doctrine of transubstantiation tells us that the elements have become in some relevant sense the body and blood of Christ. But without further specification of this claim, I take it, we don't yet know how this development is to be appropriated within a human life. By drawing on the Maccabian themes of the Eucharist as an intersection of future and past, and of our bodily relationship to the Eucharist as constituting a certain kind of communicative act, we can address this lacuna. In brief, on the Maccabian view, I take it, Eucharistic change is not simply a matter of some change in the bread and wine considered in themselves, um, but an event that makes possible a new and revolutionary mode of life, one that builds on the inbreaking of a future world, where that world is presented to us in the Eucharist in the form of a radical and also theocentric or God-directed demand. So I think, is lunch 12.15? Yes, excellent. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, going to stop pretty much then. Um, so I'm hoping that this, this account um, in these ways tracks the two positive elements of McCabe's discussion of how we should understand the Eucharist. I take it in a sort of way, it also, I hope, addresses the the two, the first two of the desiderata that I attributed to him. Um, um, I take it on the account we've been sketching, it will be wrong to say that we can understand Eucharistic change term, simply in terms of a change in role. Now, that can't be right insofar as simply re reference simply to a change in role doesn't take seriously enough. And the idea that a future world is presented to us under the appearances of bread and wine, where that claim, as at least as I want to read it, has a certain metaphysical weight. But equally, it won't do simply to say that the change in the Eucharistic elements is um, a kind of change in themselves akin to a chemical change, um, as McCabe puts it, which in some fashion is hidden from us because uh, the, that uh, way of representing the Eucharistic change doesn't take seriously the way in which Eucharistic change is woven into a call to a, a, a particular mode of life where rev and a revolutionary mode of life because the Eucharist gives, if it's a setting within which we can, in this particularly serious sense, give due acknowledgement to our eschatological future. To conclude, I would say, it is, I would say, a central strength of McCabe's account that it squarely addresses each of those two kinds of error that he, he identifies at the very beginning of the paper um, in an understanding of the Eucharist. The error of being exaggeratedly metaphysical which he addresses by drawing attention to the role of the Eucharist in enabling a certain kind of communicative act. 
So in this respect, it has a social dimension, the air of being exaggeratedly social, which he addresses by representing the Eucharist, not simply in terms of a change of role, but as an intersection of the world of the eschatological future and the present everyday world. The excitement of reading McCabe on these as other themes consists, for me certainly, and I think for others, not least in the fact that he's able so clearly and tellingly to integrate, I take it, perhaps this is a wrong reading, but it seems to me to integrate a metaphysical vision and a call to radical social and cultural change, so that neither of these perspectives is allowed to proceed entirely independently of the other. It's McCabe's capacity to see the Christian life as anchored in the action of God and the eschatological future, and at the same time, as a communicative act, I take it these are the core elements of his, his account, and at the same time as a communicative act in which we give due recognition to our responsibilities to other human beings, that marks out his work, I would say, as enduringly important and meriting a continued reading that's close and careful, as well as being, of course, uh, personally and socially transformative. So thank you. Um.